Okay, everyone. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us for uh, Amanda Samperi. I'm pretty sure I just slaughtered her name. That's um, good, Sam Perry. There you go, Amanda Sam Perry. Uh, she's gonna she's going to talk to us today about adapted books, and and uh, I'm gonna just go ahead and turn the time on over and sit back and enjoy. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my loving lovely living room. Uh, today, as he said, we're going to be talking about adapted books. So I'm going to go ahead and do a screen share over here. That way you can all see my pretty slides. And I have Slack up here as well on my phone. So please let me know if you have any questions, if you can't see anything, if something's not working, that kind of thing. And we're going to jump right in. All right, so yeah, there's pineapples here. It says welcome because pineapples are welcoming and I have a minor obsession with them and they're very fun. So our session today, adapted books. What are assimilated stories and how do we use them? And as you can see there, my name is Amanda Samperi. I am a speech language pathologist and there'll be a couple more slides to get to know me. So yes, getting to know the SLP, facts and why you should care. I feel like all presentations start with this is the reason why you should care about all the things I'm going to say. And then they tell you all the things you're going to say. So we're going to kind of use that method. This is my shameless plug side slide. I have a recently started blog, which is AAC is where it's at. And the reason I'm putting this here now is because as I was writing this presentation, I had so much that I wanted to share that I was about halfway through what I wanted to get through and I had 60 slides. Meaning there's no way I'm going to get through everything I want to say. So I'm going to be putting some blog posts up on my website, so feel free to check them out there. We'll have a lot more information. All right, so first fact, I am currently an SLP in the Massachusetts public school system. Why you should care? Much of my experience comes from working in the public schools. So that's where you'll hear a lot of my stories, and when I talk about a bunch of my different kiddos, this is where they're all at. I went to Penn State University for undergrad and grad school. Why you should care? I absolutely love Penn State. I did six years there. I bleed blue and white. And more importantly and more relevant to this, Penn State eats, sleeps, and breathes AAC. So I was surrounded by AAC for a good six years, and I think it's why I love it so much. I met my awesome hubby at Penn State, and we shipped ourselves up to Boston. That's him on the right there. That's Matt. Why you should care if you see someone else walking around or hear someone else playing video games, that would be him. I am originally from Pittsburgh. Another reason this is from. Uh, why you should care if you hear this, me say funny words like pop or gumban or hoagie or nebby, it's not my fault. Pittsburgh makes up ridiculous words and I love them very much. My hobbies include photography, playing board games, blogging, musical theater, and drinking coffee. And why you should care. I am a when I say a bit over animated, I'm really over animated. I get really excited, and that's the theater part. And I talk really fast. That's the coffee speaking. So if I'm talking too fast, please let me know. But I just want to get through everything. All right, let's get down to business. To defeat the Huns. All right, so let's go back to basics, AKA, okay, why should I care about what she is going to say? So as you all know, there are many different types of AAC methods. When I wrote this, I didn't think about the fact there'd be two days worth of presentations before this. So we're gonna talk about symbols right now. And symbols are used with individ individuals that can communicate before he or she has the literacy skills to use words. So as you know, there are a ton of different types of symbol sets. A lot of people have different reasons why they like different ones. The one in the top right corner you see there is Smarty Symbols. The one in the bottom right is Mayor Johnson PCS Symbols. And one on the left is an example of Symbol Sticks. Now, the reason I have a star by the one on the bottom right is there are actually two different sets of those symbols. Both of those are Mayor Johnson, but the top ones are the older versions and the new the newer versions of, that they're using are the ones in the bottom. So see how, like, for happy, rather than having the egg head, which I never quite understood, we have a face and hair and a shirt and shoulders, you know, that's not just an amorphic head floating around anywhere. Even for sit, it looks more like a child. And we're going to talk about this. It's going to be an important word called iconicity about symbols. Oh, here we go, iconicity. So it's our ability to understand and interpret symbols. 
And this changes over time across cultures, but it's a huge factor of the way we understand our symbols. We all know that nouns are far more salient, they're more concrete, they're less abstract, and they have higher iconicity than abstract words like pronouns and adverbs and that kind of thing. So think about a traffic light. By itself, you know, if we were to give this to someone that had never seen a traffic light, they'd probably wonder what on earth does the red, the yellow, and the green mean? They could mean absolutely nothing. Those specific colors could be like purple, brown, orange, green, would not matter because those colors in that order do not mean anything to them yet. When we learn what the color, like we have to learn what the colors mean. So think about it, we even teach our kids in this games, like red light, green light, they learn what this means. Therefore, it does not have a high iconicity rating. We have to learn and interpret the symbol. Now for a stop sign, it's a little bit easier for us to understand. It has the word stop on it. So as long as we can read, even if we don't know that shape with that color means stop usually, we can read it and figure it out. However, we still have to teach it to children because they can't read yet. So it, it, the iconicity is going to be changing as we are more familiar with things and as we, as we change and evolve. So like I said, nouns, pretty salient, pretty concrete. So I would say like a pumpkin is a pumpkin. No matter what symbol set you use, for the most part, a kid's going to figure out that this pump, you know, symbol sticks pumpkin is Mayor Johnson pumpkin is Smarty's, Smarty Simple's pumpkin. They're, they're pretty clearly a pumpkin. However, it's when we get those abstract words that get pretty tricky. And this is one of my favorite studies. Like I said, I'm Penn State proud. So everybody pull out your slack. We're going to play a little game for a second, okay? So we did this, Penn State did this study in 2007 about these frequently used core symbols. And if you already know what the symbol is because you're an SLP, please post in the Slack thing like a hashtag SLP so we know. But go ahead and write in Slack what you think this symbol is just by looking at it. I'm going to give you a second. Also, T.S. Crosby, way to go for pop. Everybody makes fun of me in Massachusetts for, co co for calling it pop. Okay, I see CA, oh gosh, I'm gonna murder these names, but empty, empty bowl, empty, empty. Give, nice, more bowl. Zia Chia, hit the nail on the head, all gone. Now keep in mind, this is an older symbol for all gone. So what they did was they brought in 50 kids for this and they asked them what they thought the symbol was just by showing them the picture. One child out of the 50 guessed that it was all, all done. Kids guessed that it was a sun, it was a clock, it was pressing a button, and this is my favorite, it was a face with lost eyes because you see how the middle part, it looks like a frown. It, it was just a face that lost its eyes. Okay, so what does that tell you if kids are not guessing the symbols that we are using with them? They're not easy to understand. All right, here's the next one that's probably going to be a lot more familiar. And yes, it does look like a light bulb. Name this symbol. Go. What do you think this symbol is? When I first saw this, I'm like, how on earth? We've got an arrow. We've got two different piles. There is no way the kids are even picking up usually what an arrow means. Nice. A lot of people are saying more and greater. And yes, this is more. When children were asked, the 50 kids they brought in, 0% guessed more. They guessed a pile of leaves, ants, grapes, apples, a volcano, and a Christmas tree, which I really get the Christmas tree, but I love the volcano answer. Um, I always thought that they were beans, to be completely honest. I just thought they were a pile of beans. So clearly not the best symbols to get across. That being said, they're doing the best they could at the time because these are hard words to depict. Last one. Again, probably be familiar with this, but name that symbol. The disembodied hands.
All right, a lot of people posting in here. Thank you guys. I love having people talk with me at the same time. This is a great way to do it. T, uh, I'm gonna butcher this name, Tavanner? I thought it was above as well, but yes, it is want. Two out of the 50 children when they brought them in guessed want. We got a TV, because we used to have our little box TVs. Cut off hands, which, I mean, yeah, why aren't the hands, a lot of the kids are focused on the fact that, like, why aren't the hands attached to anything? That's creepy and weird. And hands and soap, okay? So, again, why do we care about all of this? Well, we know that abstract words are hard to assimilate, and that's why we always talk about, like, one of the reasons we talk about core words and that we have to model it all the time and expose all the time, because they're not really easy for them to pick up. Yes, we are using these words all the time, but they're not, like, if, if I show a kid a picture of that pumpkin, remember back from that? It's a lot easier to guess the pumpkin with the object as opposed to want with the disembodied, disembodied hands. So when things are harder to pick up, they take more learning time, when they're not as innately able to be understood. That's why we have to teach it. And as Kate said before, we wanna, Kate Ahern said in her, um, her speech, we wanna motivate, model, and get out of the way. Model is one of those key word parts here, and we're gonna talk about that today. Spoken and I on my time. Okay, still doing okay on time. Am I talking too fast, or are people able to keep up with me? Because I'm kind of bowling through this. All right, just let me know in Slack if it's getting too fast. But So we're going to talk about this, and I'm sure we've heard this so many times throughout the past two days, but this is the quote that keeps me up at night. Um, the average 18-month-old has been exposed to 4,380 hours of oral language at a rate of eight hours a day from birth. The child who has a communication system receives through and receives you know, speech language therapy two times a week for 20 to 30 minutes will reach that same amount of language exposure for AAC in 84 years. This is terrifying. It cannot just be in speech. It can't be in a vacuum. It cannot be in our little, it was called our speech bubble, right? It can't just happen in that bubble. And so one of the ways that we have to think about this is how do we pull others in? Right? You are all here today because you are very excited about AAC. You want to get to learn more about it. You want to learn how to inspire others. And part of, you know, it's kind of like drinking the Kool-Aid, people call it. When I went to Penn State, they always called it drinking the Kool-Aid. Everybody is all, is all uh, blue and white. You want to get people to drink the AAC Kool-Aid. Figure out why you think it's as awesome, why they should think it's as awesome as you do. And we're gonna talk about some strategies for that today. And one of those that I really like are using adapted books, but they're a tricky thing to introduce, to use, and we're gonna talk about the next part about like why and when we should use those. So it's like learning a new language, right? We learn a new language best when we're immersed in it. We kind of talked about this in one of the other, I think just in our last uh, session. My husband just went to Mexico and his high school, high school Spanish kicked in when he was really surrounded by the language but when we talk here you know it's I'm trying to remember spanish words it's kind of really broken and hard so using a symbol set especially when you have an encoded vocabulary language systems are like learning another language in fact i can't remember where i found this but someone is trying to get one of their um prc symbol users to be able to count that as a second language that they learn in high school, how we would learn like Spanish, to try to get that to count because it takes a lot of work. Um, so in order to help these kids learn, modeling is key. Even if the kiddo, or if the kiddo doesn't see anybody else using his device, his or her device, why on earth would they use it? Like how will they learn to operate it? If they don't see anybody else doing it. This is where modeling comes in. Right? Think about how kids learn letter sound correspondence when they learn their alphabet sounds. Last year, I was a lot in a preschool room, and you, you know, the lesson is done once a week with their letters. So this is our S sound, and it's our sneaky sound, and then we read a letter, or we read a book about the sneaky sound, then we do activities with the sneaky sound. Then the sneaky sound gets put up on the wall, and we do a lot of activities, and we get a lot of chance to practice it, and then it's there all the time. And every time the S sound comes up in a book, Oh, do you remember what sound that we talked about this a couple weeks ago? It's always referenced. It never goes away. It's not we learn it that week, 
with that one teacher, and then it's done. So like I said, you know, the letter sound is constantly modeled and brought out in different, um, in different activities. Even if that's not the focus, it's always being referenced. That's how we learn a new skill, and that's how we have to have these kids learn language. So you want to surround your kids with language in the same exact way. So my little gray slides are like our take-home messages. So abstract words and concepts for learning. You want to make sure that we're learning the symbol and the concept. And this is something that I think we can get really tripped up on. I don't need them to, at some point, you know, get, here are the four pictures. Show me which one is up. Well, if you don't know what the concept up means, kind of doesn't matter that you can identify the symbol. It's a two-way street, right? So if I'm working on go. We're going to teach the concept of go in every way imaginable within a focused lesson. So here are just, you know, in spitfire mode when I'm typing these. Ready, set, go while we're walking or running or riding. Go to be pushed down the slide or on the swing. Go to start your favorite video or a game or a toy. You're going to do it when you're talking about playing Pokemon Go. You're going to put do go when you're playing with cars. Go to leave the room. I want to go out of here. Reading a book with all things that with about things that go, go dog go, go tell someone to start to tell someone to start reading a book, go to tell a story where I will go on summer vacation. We want to make sure that we don't use the same word. You know, we want to use it in a variety of different ways, but it's across activities and it has to be surrounded with their their area has to be surrounded with this language. So the concept is being modeled with the symbol. Remember, if we don't talk with the symbols, why should they? It's an incredibly important part of students in the pre-literacy phase of learning, right? So, symbolated books. The reason we're all here today. This is another way to increase symbol exposure. And it's like, yay, she's finally talking about the books. Okay. So, check these out. Now, this is where I have some examples here. Um, Stop sharing. Okay. All right. So, now one of my students last year, I believe, was absolutely in love with anything Elephant and Piggy. Can you hear me okay? It says the mic is muted, and I don't know if that's just me. You're fine. Oh. Thanks, sorry. I didn't know if that was me or not. Okay, so absolutely obsessed with Elephant and Piggy. One of the only things we could get her attention to engage in was put the symbol in an Elephant and Piggy book. So that's what we did. So we have I broke my trunk here. And one of our symbols is I. So as we're going to talk, you know, I broke my trunk. Oh, I bet I, I know that's in your talker. I'm going to find that in your talker this time. And all right, we're going to start reading our story. I broke my trunk. Now, as you can see, as we go through, and it says, like, I have not seen Gerald today. Why? Hmm. Do I see Gerald? No, I, I don't see Gerald. And as we go through, right, the symbols are kind of placed throughout our pages. These are ones that we had, e now, keep in mind, I know there's a lot of different symbols in here. We chose these specifically. They're either one or two new ones that we're working on currently learning. All the rest of them are ones that she's already been introduced and is familiar with, so we're putting them in there. But look, there are a lot of words on this page. I'm gonna put something. Do, 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 do. A lot of words on this page. I have two pictures. We're going to talk about this in a little bit, but you don't want to overwhelm them. You don't need a picture for every single word. That's bad. That is not good. Um, and there's research to support that that's not what we want to do with symbolated books, and we'll talk about that later. Um, so we go through, and, you know, there's one of the words we're working on is on. So if anybody knows this book, Elephant has a dream where we keep putting stuff on his trunk. So, so it goes, and he goes, and then I lifted them on my trunk. Gosh, that would hurt to have it on my trunk. And we turn it over. There's another person on his trunk, right? So I'm pointing the symbols as we go along. And I'm going to stop getting ahead of myself and show you another example. This was 
one of my students, we were working on just introducing questions. And he can answer some basic, basic ones receptively. I wanted to start getting them receptively. And he loves animals, really, really proud of his understanding of animals. Uh, like he is very proud of it. So what better book? You know, brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? We were just starting to work on combining symbols too and getting more than just that one word phrase. And so they had been doing in their circle time, a snowman, snowman, what do you see? So we went ahead and when we did this on the smart board for the month of, I think, January or February, the symbols were there. Extra exposure and it's, it gives a good modeling opportunity. The reason why I like these in a limited quantity, you don't wanna do this for every book, it takes a lot of time, but you wanna make sure that you're doing it for the right situation. So you have I see, what do you see? Notice I didn't put, I see a winter hat looking at me. I did not put a symbol for every single word. I'm just doing it for the target ones, okay? Uh, you can find a lot, a lot of examples of these little what do you see books for a bunch of different holidays on Teachers Big Teachers, and a lot of them are free. Um, these ones were from kindergartens, kindergarten smorgasbord at blo blogspot.com. She has them for all these little holidays. So what I did was we did some regular, put them off, laminated them, bound them. These ones, oh, so you can see they're gonna be like that, right? Oh, where did my ones go? Oh, well, I think you get the gist, but my other ones have I see a shamrock waiting for me, okay? So as you can see, they're placed in here, they're selective. We're gonna, we're gonna go a little bit more into that. Does anybody have any questions or wanna see any more of them before I move on? Yes, we'll talk about the programs to use for the book. Sorry, I'm just looking at Slack now. Um, <laughs> where do I find time to make the books? While I watch TV, uh, the, so the key with this, and there's a, you know, Carol Sangari is one of the gods of RAC, and she posts a really interesting article that talks about where you want to spend your time and how time-consuming adaptive books are, and why we, um, why we pick and choose selectively on what students we want to use them with. So we can go a little bit more into that and I can show you some quick ways that you can easily adapt them for different students. Uh, the name of the blog spot again is, let me see, is kindergartensmorgasbord.blogspot.com. She has a lot of them and they're really cute. They're really, really cute. All right, so I'm gonna go back into screen share mode. Jill, did you grab that? If not, I can type in it at the end. Uh, I just didn't want to waste anyone else's time, or didn't want to waste too much time. Oh, excuse me. All right. So, yeah, let me know, guys, if you have more questions. I'll answer them as we as I as they come up. Okay. So we have simulated books come in many. And simulated and adapted books, I think, is really what I should have said here. Adapted books come in many ways and shapes and forms. What it's not. So what are simulated books not? And I think this is the most important part. Uh, thank you for posting that link. Um, so what simulated books are not? And I think this is where people fall into pitfalls with simulated books and adapted books. And I... Uh, I think this is a very, very important. So, what they're not. Simulated books are not replacing all the words with books or, or with symbols or supplementing all the words with symbols. And this is something that, um, if anybody has a subscription to the news for you or news to you, excuse me, on uh, symbol sticks over here, I did a screenshot of one of their examples. And this is what they do they put symbols for every single word. Jane Farrell released an article in you know 2013 that talked about symbolated text and she found, excuse me, you know, evidence-based practice is part of or it has different areas, and one of them is what we find in our practice. And she found in her practice that using symbolated 
text that has a symbol for every word actually slowed down her readers when they were going through a text. It was distracting. And she was saying, even, you know, for us, that's a lot of images on a page. And uh, if there's a lot of images on the page. And if you take away the words, you and I can't draw meaning out of that. Even if we're familiar with most of the symbols, it really makes it hard. Um, and research from, from Erickson, and I have, I have the research article here, uh, this came out in 2010, and it says, literacy, assistive technology, and students with significant disabilities. And I'm going to scroll down just to tell you, I like his implications. They talk about, you know, simulated text, and it says that it can, simulated text can make it more difficult if you're practice, if you're focusing on learning the words. If you were practicing le learning your, you know, your ability to decode and understand text, you do not want to be putting symbols in the book. So every time we do a lesson, we think about what is the goal? In that half hour, or that 40 minutes, or that hour, or that 20 minutes, what do you want this student or client to be doing? If the goal is for them to be learning to decode text, you do not want to put extra distractions in there. If the goal is to provide access to con so that's what this line is here. The goal is to provide access to content and careful attention is paid to selecting picture symbols that reflect the meaning of the word in the text. It is reasonable to expect that the pictures would increase access to the content that would otherwise not be accessible. So, for example, the, the little guy that I'm using, these the little leprechaun in the Easter Bunny, what do you see? And we talked about him using um, Brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? My goal is to expand his language and to give him a sentence frame. So we had, he had just started, he hadn't really been introduced to question words expressively at all yet. He's a fast learner. He does really well when things are modeled for him and when he's given a structured opportunity. Great, he loves animals, let's pull this out. And by the third page, he's able to ask, what do you see? It was awesome. But I was able to model because the symbols were already in the page for him. And when that really comes in handy, now if, if he's with me all the time and he is not necessarily needing, like I, I, I know how to model relatively well on his device. I'm comfortable with it. It doesn't bother me. He's not always going to be with people that are super comfortable with modeling. And that's why I love these so much. When you have simple ones like this for a classroom and they get don donated into their classroom library, it provides such a great modeling opportunity. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more. So thank you so much for posting that article as well. It's a great research article. And honestly, some of the simulated text part is a small portion of it. I think it's a wonderful read and a great resource. Um, OK, so another thing simulated books are not. Like we said, they're not replacing all the words with symbols. And this is what we talked about already, that they can it can interfere with literacy development, and it can really make things confusing. So, simulated books are also not a crutch or a pirate, because pirates are hilarious. Uh, just because we give the child a book with symbols in it doesn't mean that we're teaching them, right? Um, Janice Light always talks about if you hand a kid the device and you leave, she always says, may the ghost of Janice Light haunt you. If you give them a simulated book and you leave, may my ghost haunt you. Because it's not really helping. Unless they're familiar with it and they know the symbols and this is something they've read a thousand times, it's not really helpful, right? We can't also assume that they're learning just because we handed it to them. It's also not literacy instruction. I think this is a very important part. Teaching symbols is not the same thing as teaching a kid to read. Just because we hand a kiddo a book with some symbols in it that they might use to communicate does not mean that they're learning the text. Does not mean that we're giving them literacy instruction. That is a very different thing. That is something I will not go into right now. Um, but like I said, I'm a PSU born and bred. So the if you go to the if you're looking for something like that, go to the RERC page of Penn State and they have, it's free. They have a lot of evidence-based research there and can kind of guide you through that. There are also many other programs to teach kids how to read with significant disabilities. Um, but giving them a simulated book is not a way to do that. So what is it? 
or what it is. What is symbolate? What are symbolated books? Symbolated books are a great way to boost interest in books. So my students are now finding more interest in books, even though they aren't readers yet. This kiddo that I've been talking about has a lot of complicated vision issues, and for whatever reason that we can't figure out yet, we're working with vision specialists the whole nine yards. He's having trouble identifying the letter, the, the letters because of by vision. So even though he might know the B sound, he's not really able to distinguish any of his letters. He's not really telling the difference between many of them. While we're trying to figure that out, I still need him to learn language, right? And I want him to have an interest in books. So even though he's not really distinguishing between the letter A and the B and C, I can get him interested in books. And when, the, when I came in the beginning of the year, his interest in books was really biting them. Now I have, like, they're showing how to sit and do a shared read because they're used to it now. And it's fun. And they like, he loves, loves hanging out with people. It's a great way to do that. It's another way to include core words in the classroom. So after making the symbolated stories, leave them with your kiddos, right? They're no longer yours. They're meant for your child, for your student or your client. They're another way to have learning material in their library. They increase pre-literacy skills. I love this little, little gentleman sitting in his cute chair reading. So after, like I was saying, after being introduced to stories briefly in our lessons, my students started holding the books um, near like closer to themselves they started flipping the pages left to right and they started paying attention to the flipping the individual pages before it was flip flip closed and we're on to the next one and now they're starting to pay attention that there's content in there so, yay victories symbolated books are mostly a way to promote modeling in my opinion okay remember how we talked about how important modeling is simulated stories are an easy focused, clear way for staff to start modeling with their students, especially with staff turnover rates, right? I know support staff can get pretty high with turnover or they might change to different kiddos and they might now be with an AAC user and they weren't before and they want to help the kid and they don't know how. It's really easy to say, hey, there's this book that you're going to read with them and it has symbols in there that has the word on top and as you're reading, you're going to point out the symbols. And maybe find it in their talker or their AAC device, whatever. And then if the kid is comfortable with it, maybe they can read a page or read one of the symbols. And it starts that dialogue between staff and students of let's just get comfortable with symbols. Let's get comfortable with talking together. Um, people only, I'm very, very, very biased with that last statement. People only feel, will only model what they feel comfortable with. If your staff are not comfortable with symbols, they're not going to model the use of them. This is another way that is very structured and easy for them to pick up and just roll with. Simulated books are also another way to target specific words. So, like I said, we in that my little um, my elephant and piggy book. It's another way to target core language. This this little girl was only only wanted an elephant and piggy book i could pick up another book unless it was about a duck or an elephant and piggy book she did not care so all right let's let's start talking about them within the context of this book it is it was a good way for you know staff to be comfortable with that symbol and if they see it in that symbol they're likely or in that in that story they're likely to use it in other situations it's important to encourage generalization. So don't just get stuck using the word in that book, right? Okay, we're gonna talk about the word start today. That's why we're gonna start with it in our book. And then maybe when you see it throughout the week, you could pull up it up, pull it up on their talk or start. And you're just gonna to talk to them. That's the most common phrase I've heard the past two days. Just talk to your kids, talk to your students. So our take home message, simulated stories are for increased modeling and exposure. They are not a crutch. We do not want pirates. So how do we make them? Creativity and TLC, right? So I love books, I absolutely love them. All these books I bought at my local library, and if you were going to manipulate an actual book, unless it's in your school room, I highly suggest going to your library, going in with like 20 bucks and seeing how much you can, you can get them for, or how much you can spend, how many books you can get with that, because I always have great luck there. So to making simulated books, here are some of my rules for it. You don't want to cover the words, right? Even when we give, we design an AAC system, we leave the words because it's more exposure to text. 
I have had students that, as they are being tested for their three-year reevals, knew some sight words that were not directly taught, and we really believe it's because she had exposure to them with her AAC device. So do not cover the words. Just like symbols, they need constant exposure to written language. Add symbols when ne or where necessary. So pick two or three targets for a symbol. Remember in that story, you know, I didn't have every single word with every single symbol. You don't want to overwhelm them visually or linguistically. And I've done that before. I had a book where I had on one page, I had seven symbols. No one's paying attention to the symbols and then the words and then the actual pictures on the page. It's just way too overwhelming. And then laminate when less necessary. If you're going to put your heart and soul into these, make it last. So how do you get the symbols? One of the ways to do that is screenshotting or taking the symbols from an online database. So if you do Boardmaker Online, Symbol Sticks Online, uh, I think Smarty Symbols also has another one online. I'm blanking on other ones, but I know there's more online database, databases. Um, you can print glue out and do that. So what I'm going to stop screen sharing real quick. And I want to show you. So depending on the book, is depends on what, depending on what media or medium I have, excuse me, is how I'll do it. So I, when I did my little leprechaun books, what do you see? I screenshotted my kid's device. And that was the easiest thing for me because I knew it was the same color coding. I knew it was the same symbol. I knew that unless things were changed, that was exactly what that kid is used to seeing. So that took kind of that element out of it for me. Oh, and Cough Drop has an online one too. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, so I screenshotted and I put them in a Word doc, just those little images, pasted a bunch of them, and then printed them out. After that, it's a matter of chop them, but I chopped what do you see all together, and then I see and glue them in. That part's time consuming, especially if you want to use a bunch of different symbols. If you're using the same phrase over and over again, it's a good idea. Um, so that was how I did it one time. Okay, I'm going to show you another one. Um, so here is the, so I have, I have students that use uh, touch chat with symbol sticks right now. Um, there's a couple of my AAC users. So I screenshotted one of our pages like this, and then I just went through, and if you're on a Mac, um, it's command shift four to screenshot, and then I dragged like this. And it makes that lovely camera noise, and that's your screenshot. So I went through and did that for each of these. I learned, I have to find where it was, but someone was saying you can actually make it into an even grid on here to chop up your page a little bit easier. But I can do this in a matter of like a minute or two, so it's not too shabby, because you can just keep dragging and dropping. And that's how I got all my symbols here. And once you do it once, you have them and you save them all. So it's not like you have to do it every time. So then... I put them in my Word doc. I dragged them in the order, right? And then I highlighted all of them, or two of them. Copy, paste. And then I just dragged them down. So it's really as simple as that, um, especially if you're using common phrases. It's not too bad. So I'm just checking in Slack. Um, so, oh, right screen share. Come on, Come on, internet. Share. All right, and we're back. So, another way, uh, Amanda from Saltillo was talking about this during one of our USAC chats, which is great. And, uh, she said that she found out you can print them on labels, which can make things really fast. So she has her label set up, and I believe usually when you get labels now, they come in a Word doc format, uh, and they, um, they come with a format that you can download. She plugged her symbols into there and peel them off, put them right in the book. Nice and easy for her. So shout out to her, thank you very much. What I use, because as I am, young and a teacher and rather poor I don't usually go out and buy all of my books as they are so I use this wonderful app and this has is a free app so I'm not getting anything from you know 
no advertising or anything like that, but I just really like it. It makes my life easier. So it's called Cam Scanner. You can use this to scan any document. So anytime you need to scan anything that's white and you want it to come out like a white piece of paper, so I put my signature on different things. Um, and you can save the pictures. So I did this with one of the books that we owned, but I wanted, you know, the classroom owned it, we bought it, but I wanted to use, you know, adapt it for one of the kids. So I took pictures throughout all of it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to stop screen sharing real quick again. Because, so I wanna see, can you, oh, you can see my screen. So it's this one here, can scan it, and when it opens up, it's pretty straightforward. So I'm just gonna show you a book I already did. Um, so from head to toe, right? There's one the classroom already had. I went and I took pictures of all of them, or all the pages, so I, I, I didn't feel so bad because we already bought it, right? Scan them all in, and what you can do is, in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a button with three dots, and you can say Upload, and then it gives you these options. You can upload them to a cloud device, so I usually do Google Drive, because that's what my school has, and see here it says you can do it a PDF or a JPEG. Do what suits your fancy. If you're gonna just print it, you wanna do a PDF usually, it's easier. If you wanna symbolize it in PowerPoint, which I'm gonna show you, you can do you want to do images. So I hit my J or my JPEG files, which are my images. It's going to upload all those all to my to my cloud. And then I can drag and drop into a PowerPoint presentation. Let me find one. Oh, well, I'll find it at the end. Basically, what I do is I, I drag and drop into a PowerPoint presentation. Let me show you with a different picture. All right. Actually, let me go with one. Mm -hmm. Sorry, technical difficulties. Uh, that was weird. All right, try two. You know, we got up and running on time, so clearly something had to go awry. No, I just had it really big. Okay, so maybe a little smaller. I've only had a Mac for like a year, so I'm still ooh, still learning. And say I was gonna. Oh my goodness, this is not working. No, Matt, I'm not telling you. <laughs> okay, so say I wanted to use and put my symbol on my page here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, oh, that's what we'll do. We'll pretend one of our coloring pages is a book. Okay, so I, I'm going to delete. Let's say this is the first picture page of our book. And you can tell me, people, if this is making no sense whatsoever. So say I want this picture in here, and I'm going to say, all done. It's going to be in my book. It's as simple as that. I'm going to draw, drag in page one. I'm going to drag in whatever symbol I want, rearrange them, manipulate them, and then I'm going to print it. And that is how I made the I Broke My Trunk book. Does that make sense? Is anybody really confused with what I'm talking about? Let me know in Slack. Does that, does that make sense to people? Because I tried explaining this to someone that had no idea what I was talking about, and they seemed to get it. Right, and Lacey, once I once I assimilated a very hungry caterpillar. Yeah, you can also you can you can uh, put vo uh, Velcro in there and do them for all kinds of different stuff. I only have a couple minutes. All right, lots of people are understanding me. Thank goodness. All right, I'm gonna keep going here because I've got like five minutes, and I want to make sure we get through the rest of this. All right, so. Simulated books are one way of adapting books. Another way is to make them accessible. Those are kind of two different things, and I want to touch on both of those. So, in Carol Sangari's post for five plus ways to make page fluffers and spacers. So basically, you want to use anything that's going to prop up a page. Think about if you have one of those really fine books, and sometimes those corners are just really difficult to get up. So you want to use anything to make that page prop up. 
So people have said on board books, you put a little hot glue on the corner, which makes them space so the kid can just get their hand underneath that corner. I've seen people use sponges on, like cut out sponges part, uh, parts of them on either different things they want to rip out of the book or on the bottom of the page. I know Perkins School for the Blind a lot of time uses foam blocks to raise anything that they feel is important or to raise the back of pages. Uh, soft Velcro allows also like a tactile cue on the corner of the page. Sometimes you want to simplify the text. So sometimes there are just too many darn words on a page. And this can be, you know, difficult for comprehension. This can be difficult for visually complex. And the easiest way I could do that, so you can do that with or without a computer, right? If you have a digital copy, you just cover the area with a white text box, or with a white um, box and add new text onto it. So I literally just take my shape here, and I would just cover up what I didn't want to see, and then I'd recolor it white. You're not even going to know it's there. With an actual book, just put white paper on it and then write or type over it. Pretty simple to do, but sometimes it makes a world of a difference. Breaking down the book, right? Sometimes you want to change the binding. You want to cut apart and rebind it. I had a kiddo, like I said, that everything went in his mouth. So when he got a favorite book, we chopped it up and we laminated the whole thing and put it on put thicker binding on it so that way it, it lasted more than a day. Sometimes you want to add it to a slant board or make it raised a little bit. Sometimes you want to make it digital. So remember that scanning app? If you want to use cam scanner or something like it to make your book digital, someone may be able to access it that way, especially if you're using if somebody uses switch access or like eye gaze access, it's a great idea to access books. So digital books. Uh, there are a bunch of different apps you can use for this. You can, or just um, programs in general. So Tar Heel Reader is a great, 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 great free resource. It is a free app, and, and I believe it's Tar Heel because of North Carolina. And they actually have a Tar Heel Reader and a Tar Heel Games. I haven't really played around with the games, but the Tar Heel Reader, when you click it, it asks you to go in. I'm going to show you real quick because I have it up in my iPad. Stop, screen share. All right. So, Tar Heel Reader is this one right here. And the first, so your options down here find a book, write a book. So it's super easy, it's switch accessible. You can download whatever people have and modify them. It's all free, it's a great resource. Great, great resource for digital books, right? So if I want to find a book, one I found this morning to show you, which I thought was really awesome, is sloths because sloths are adorable, right? And so it's pretty simple, right? Sloths. And then I just flip the page, and it's switch accessible, and I can add symbols if I want. Or, you know, I just, anybody can access a book this way. We can make our own books to talk about what, to for like a writing prompt to talk about what we already know. It's just so many different things you could do with it. All right. So we have, so if you have the iPad, there's also that book builder that's a free app. Pictello is an app I love. Again, you can re uh, very accessible, a lot of possibilities with it. I believe it's $14.99. Um, I use this a lot with my students to talk about what happened over the weekend because everybody asked that question on Monday. And it's really difficult for students that don't remember or don't have a visual prompt or can't always tell you right away. It's a great Sunday night activity for parents. I swear to you, I'm almost on with slides. Look at that at the end. Okay. Um, Go Talk Now app, we've used that to make books as well. Google Slides, like what I have right here, it's free. PowerPoint, it's another thing that's free. If somebody uses a computer or if somebody, um, if you even wanted to print off a book with that, completely free. Uh, PowerPoint's not, I don't think PowerPoint, I think PowerPoint comes with Windows Suite, so it comes on most standard things now. <clears throat> Excuse me, manipulative books. So if anybody knows Laura Mize, she uh, talks about early intervention a lot, but she'll put, she has this video here that talks about pulling the pictures off the page to get young ones or anyone that's not really involved in books, physically involved with it. You can also add objects with the books. So when we did Five Little Ducks, we brought out all the little rubber duckies and we acted it out because sometimes just reading isn't enough to really get what's going on. Then we talked about it. Then we sang the song. You know. All the different parts of it, but objects really help with comprehension. Teachers Pay Teachers, there's a lot of manipulative books. 
what was the name of the last app show? Tar Heel Reader. Hold on, I can write this in. Tar Heel Reader. Yes, and Patello is super awesome. And for the amount, the, the price per use ratio for Patello, I have not found many things better. Um, and books with audio and our books with move in our movement on the smart board. A lot of places have smart boards now, and it's very interesting to see young ones trying to get involved with them. Um, and, our, and this classroom was great because smart boards are virtually, in, it's really hard to destroy the newer ones. So get your kids on it, get them active. They can move things, they can, you know, when they hit stuff, it has actions like the old school PowerPoint things. Um, and if you use Smart Share, it's kind of like an online, it's an online database. You can download a lot of pre-made things. That's where we got that snowman, snowman, what do you see? I added the symbols, but somebody else made that. It was great. So our take home message. Symbolated stories are for increased exposure and modeling. They're not a substitute for direct teaching and learning. Um, they're another method of learning, but they're not a way that you're going to teach your kids to read. They're, it's a way that you're going to help and supplement. Um, I think it's a great tool to help facilitate modeling within a classroom, uh, but it's not the end all be all. It's just another thing you can do to help. Like I said, I didn't get to get everything in my slides today, so shameless plug. Uh, I'm gonna be posting more information in different spots um, with some of the research articles and just some more pictures about what I've actually done. If you guys have any more questions, um, I think I'm about out of time, but Unless they'll let me to have an, I might be able to answer one or two questions. Unless they kick me off. Nobody's after you. Keep going. All right, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, you can ask uh, Kristen K. Yeah, you can absolutely use Google Slides rather than PowerPoint. Um, PowerPoint was just what I went to first the one time. Okay. Uh, let's try to see how. For Google Slides, I haven't really been able to do the drag and drop. Oh, I can. I, sometimes I have trouble with that when you get too many of them or when the file's too big. So you can always do insert image and then put it in there. But yeah, same idea. All right. I don't really see any other questions. Uh, like I said, feel free to uh, hit me up with any other questions, comments, concerns, and we can keep chatting. But thank you all so much. All right. Well, Amanda, we appreciate it. We want to thank you for uh, joining in on our first annual AC in the cloud. And we, we super fun. Uh, and I had another reason. Hold on, I got a Brad. Got another reason to wear my "Speak for Yourself" AAC shirt, which was great. So, yay! Oh, wonderful. <laughs> well, we appreciate. It. You have a good afternoon. All right. I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you. Bye. Bye.